morning, teachers and learners. Sorry for the delay. We were just waiting for a few more people to join the meeting. Um, while we are waiting, I would like the learners to quickly do the questions. Um, question one to five um, on the notes. I'm going to give you 15 minutes um, just to complete those questions. Your teachers will provide you with the answers. Um, and then uh, you'll see that on the WhatsApp group, I have pinned a few example questions for geomorphology that I would very dearly like to go through. Um, and then I'll also post the answers to those questions at the end. And then we will carry on with the PowerPoint. I would just like to know if everyone can hear me. Um, and if anyone has any problems, then kindly just um, raise your concerns um, in the chat group or on the, I'll also keep an eye on the WhatsApp group. Uh, Mr. Ferrero, if you are in, can you just give me the thumbs up, please? Um, morning, everyone. Um, Ma'am, everything is clear, loud and clear. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, sir. Okay, um, grade 12's last uh, session yesterday, we uh, ended with the word board for river rejuvenation. Um, and I know I'll only keep you busy until 10 o'clock. Um, so in your, uh, it's called the survival kit for paper one. A lot of the terms uh, for this word board will be there. Um, but what I would like you to do in the next, we have about 10 minutes left, um, is just to quickly go through questions one to five. So I'm quickly going to share the questions, should anyone not have access to them. Where is that now? Right, so great Wells, it's these questions, questions one to five, just for now. I know we have done question six, um, that was the interactive one in the table, and then question seven we've also done yesterday, and then from question eight onwards, we will do at the end of today's session. So it's only questions one to five, if you are not finished, don't worry. I will start with the recap of the questions that are pinned to the WhatsApp group, and I'll also share the screen with you um, at about 17 minutes past eight. If the teachers can just ensure that the learners do have these questions with them, um, I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much.
Learner, sorry for the interruption. If you would like to share your answers on the WhatsApp group, you are welcome to do so. Uh, Mr. Ferreira, my moderator, informed me that he's struggling with his uh, microphone. So if any of the other teachers spot something in the chat group, um, we're going to try our best to deal with the technological gremlin. Um, he's always on top of it. So I think it might just be the weather playing and wreaking havoc on us. Um, but let's see if we can sort it out. If not, I'd like the assistance of our fellow colleagues. If there's anything that pops up, uh, pops up, uh, please just uh, inform me. You can interrupt me at any point. Um, but thank you very much. And thank you, sir, for trying to, to figure it out. But we will, like he said, we will cup on um, and we will get things going. All right, I'm going to give uh, another three minutes just for the questions. Um, I do hope our learners are safely at school. Um, it wouldn't be nice just to speak to the screen for two hours. Right, I am back. Um, great Twelves, what I would like uh, to point out with the concepts is when they asked for a drainage basin, you can't just say that the area is drained by a river and that's that, because the drainage basin is not just the main river, it's the river and its tributaries. So this section over here, I'm going to make the... Um, 
the writing red. That's what we are looking for when we mark. I always say a lot of the learners are giving me all the ingredients for a magnificent cake, but they don't supply me with the oven. So I can't do anything with the batter if I don't have the heat. Um, and let's be honest, I do not want to eat batter on a birthday. So the second um, concept was the confluence. And we've dealt with that yesterday where we, you guys got confused with the confluence and the interfluve. And the reason why I pointed those two out is the fact that the confluence is the point where two rivers or streams meet. Now, an easy way to remember that is um, in church, a congregation, or even a conference. It's where people meet. So that's my way of remembering the concept confluence. And interfluve is the high-lying area that separates the tri uh, tributaries within the same drainage basin. And then the difference between the watershed and the interfluve is the watershed separates the different drainage basins, but then the interfluve is within that watershed, so to speak. And um, the interfluve will then separate the tributaries, all those small rivers joining the mainstream. Base flow I referred to yesterday, it's the movement of the groundwater that then seeps into the streams. Very important with question 2.1, grade 12, is they ask you to identify the types of rivers. And again, the answers are right in front of you. They say in the key that the water table in the rainy season is the small dotted line, and then the water table in the dry season is the more longer line, the dashed line. So A, you can see that even in the dry season, they still have water. Therefore, it's a permanent river. And then B, you can see that if that's the uh, river bed, you can see that the river only has water in the rainy season, therefore uh, periodic. If I move on to the next one, and in your uh, survival kit, there's an absolutely amazing summary of the different types of drainage patterns, the different uh, underlying structures, as well as how they look. So um, you, your teachers will issue you with the answers. So don't shoot me for going uh, through the answers too quickly. Um, then also what I would like to point out with question five, just quickly go there, is sometimes we can ask you um, concepts in a different way. So over here, it says it's a stream flow or discharge of the river um, and where they would likely occur. So they tell us that over here where we have the, the lines, we have land and it has to be a river. Um, so it means that the water is not flowing smoothly. Therefore, it is a turbulent flow, and we will find that in the upper course where the erosion is still um, quite rough. Um, the velocity is, is also strong. And then when we get to the laminar flow, remember yesterday we said that the river flows in sheets or parallel sheets. So these arrows are positioned parallel to each other and they're not as twisted and turned and bent like the arrows in diagram A. Great 12s, I want you to quickly have a look at the questions that are posted on the um, on the WhatsApp group. I seem to have misplaced my one now. I just quickly want to get the um, no, that's the answers. Um, hmm. Just have a look quickly where it is. Otherwise, if I can't find it, I will just have a look. Oh, my goodness. If I can't find it now. Example questions, answers. Did I post the answers or the questions now? I'm confused yeah. Um, because it won't be fun if I <laughs> if I posted the 
answers. Okay, any case, let's move along. What I can do is the following quickly. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Um, so what I've done over here is, ooh, let's make this a little bit smaller. So remember yesterday, we also had this exact same diagram on our slides. So over here, I told my learners, this is um, well, one of my question papers that I used in June. And I said, I used this and I asked them, a different way. So we knew that A is the watershed from yesterday, that B would be the source, C would be the uh, tributary, D would be the confluence, and E would be the river mouth. So the questions that I that I put on the group is where river flows into a large body of water. So have a look at where do we have an arrow that points towards where the river flows into a larger body. Um, so these are types of questions that uh, teachers use, and I know I'm very fond of using a diagram and getting rid of everything else. Um, and you can see here, uh, I created a teacher development that Mr. Glenn Samai presented to us. Um, and it's it's also on, on your PowerPoint. So you can see yesterday I used, I actually said D um, and or C, not D. So confluence was over here. Um, and it's, it's a different way of, of asking things, which means that you have to know your terms. The reason why I'm posting these questions, grade 12s and teachers, is that I've noticed the trend where, uh, oops, that's too small, apologies, where examiners are now starting to put photos and diagrams into the columns questions. So, now, I just quickly want to get all five onto the screen. So now they say rivers in the interior of South Africa flowing in the wet seasons. And yesterday we had these two diagrams, this one where my cursor is now at A, at C, and at D. Now, the only issue here is you have to be able to know that the top line will most likely be my uh, water table in the rainy season um, and then the bottom one water table in the uh, dry season so over here you can see that this water table this poor river has got nothing the water table in the rainy and the wet season is not on the river bed and I've taken these uh, terms directly from either their textbook or the slides and also what I've done is you can see that this pattern over here, you can see that it radiates outwards. Therefore, the uh, diagram at B is a radial uh, uh, drainage pattern. So that would be rivers flowing from a conical hill toward agricultural land. Now I've changed it a little bit because my learners, I wanted them to know that it's a conical hill. Therefore, it's from a, the highest point. Um, and it radiates outwards towards the lowest point. And then this one over here, rivers flowing in areas where hard rock is well jointed. So that's our rectangular. You can see the 90 degree bends. Then also this one, I'm going to make this question a little bit bigger, is a different way of asking. But there's a reason why I'm putting this question out there. So. A, you can see B, you can see C, you can see the water table, groundwater. It's a little bit blurred because I've zoomed in so much. But it says precipitation. It says headwaters. It shows the flat plain. It shows the tributary, the hillside, and then the watershed boundary. And if you ever look at, let me just scroll up quickly, this diagram over here, you can use the next one, this one, to help you with a diagram at question 2.1. One thing that my learners struggled with is this diagram at D, which 
uh, represents a braided stream where you have your de uh, sand deposits and then the river interconnects through those sand deposits. So I want you to look at how this question is constructed. Identify the courses at A, B, C, and D. So A would be the upper course, B the middle course, and C and D would be our lower course of the river. And then I asked them, even though it's just for three marks, draw a rough annotated, which means I have to add labels, cross sections for each of the stages identified in question 2.3.1. So remember, we have the young, mature, and the old age stage. So they actually just had to look at the sketch and draw those cross sections. However, they did exactly the same mistake that a lot of you did yesterday. You would draw the V-shaped valleys and you would add the water, but to the untrained eye, we don't know what it is. So that's very important. And I'll also um, share the answers because it means that if they didn't have labels, I could not give them one mark. Now you would say, yo, ma'am, that is extremely rough and tough on them. It is because I wanted them to learn now already in order to not make mistakes in their trial exams and ultimately never make that mistake at the end of the year. Identify feature D. And then also what's interesting is 2.3.3 links up with 2.3.6. So you have to know all your features. You have to be able to identify them. And this links us back to the questions that geographers ask. So what is it? What is D? Um, and so D shows the water. Now, a lot of the learners answered turbulent flow, but none of the arrows have the twist and that bend. So it can't be a turbulent flow. All right. Um, in which course will you find oxbow lakes? Just to direct them, provide a reason for your answer. So can you see that if your question, if your answer in question 2.3.4 was upper course and you provide a reason, it would be wrong because these questions are linked. Also identify feature D, and let's say they said feature D is turbulent flow, they're going to have a little bit of an issue when they have to explain the formation. So these 15 marks were put under the more middle order and higher order because it required them to analyze, evaluate, and apply their knowledge a lot more. All right. Then if we move along to this one, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, as later on in the slides, we will do river capture. Um, but again, what are they asking us? So um, very important, the type of erosion. So there you can see there's an abandoned channel and A. Um, and I specifically chose this uh, question because I wanted them to look at the cultivated land getting less. Um, so what's interesting to note is this question built from name, which, and then there was a definition, explain a possible reason, and then the last question construction here was the paragraph. And very important, where they went wrong, is they confuse the captured stream and the capture stream. Um, and I'm actually glad that I can share these questions with you because there's a similar question in the uh, PowerPoint. All right, uh, what I would do is I will also share my memo with you for these questions um, just to see how it's it's been asked. But most specifically, I want you to remember that even in a, a multiple choice question, we can ask diagrams or photos. And in the table and the columns, we can also refer to um, diagrams in your in your short questions. All right, let's get back to the PowerPoint and the Word, Word board. So what we're going to do today is the fluvial processes and the rejuvenation of 
the rivers. Now, very important to note, again, you have to know before you write. Um, I always say it is absolutely crucial to um, make sure that you know your content, uh, you know how it looks, you know how it looks on a photo, you know how it looks on a diagram. And I always advise my learners, you know you're always on YouTube and Google. Type the word into Google and see what you get. You'll get photos, you'll get diagrams, you'll get um, hand-drawn concepts uh, in someone's thesis. Uh, and those are all things that, that we as teachers and examiners look at and, and, and we think, how can we ask this? So it's very important to study your work by means of the um, questions that geographers ask. Right. So now, um, river rejuvenation, and I absolutely love um, the photo there, although I also um, feel that after the holiday, teachers need another holiday. So if you rejuvenate, you restore a youthful appearance. Um, a lot of you will know that you would hide all your little wrinkles, and um, a lot of the girls want to hide their pimples, and they want to look nice and um, and pretty. So rejuvenation literally means that the river is rejuvenated. It means that, oopsie daisy, so you have a gradual slope, a graded stream, and then ultimately the gradient then becomes steeper, so therefore there's more energy. So the gradient in the lower course becomes steep. In other words, that lady on the left photo, she looked worn down. Um, and then the photo on the right, her skin looked younger, almost re-energized. So very important with river rejuvenation, the river becomes stronger. It has more energy. Then very important is the next concept. Ooh, don't freeze on me now. Okay. Is the concept isostatic uplift. Now, erosion will lower the land and then you will have your isostatic uplift where you will have a raised beach. So let's have a look. So isostasy refers to the vertical movement of the land mass. You can see that that red arrow points upwards vertically. Therefore, isostatic uplift, the land gradually rises when it becomes lighter as eroded material is removed. And I have a sneaky suspicion that these newer terms, terms that we don't necessarily see, um, on PowerPoints and in our books and in our notes that they will be somewhere. Um, there's a reason why Mrs. Prinsler always gives us these difficult terms. Right, so the next one is faulting, so a little bit of grade 10 work. So rocks can fracture if under severe pressure, and then one part of the rock can then move downwards, upwards, or sideways past the other. The one that I would like to look at is river capture or then stream piracy. So let's have a look. What are they giving us? And I want you guys to pay very close attention. Um, what they've given us is they've given us river A and river B before and after river capture. So when the river with more energy and erosive power cuts back through headward erosion at the source, and it cuts through the watershed, it will then intercept the river on the other side. So let's have a look at the following. So there's River A, and you can see that it's going to cut back. So in the first before, and then after, you can see that the gray area over here literally cuts through the dashed line. So River A now has more discharge and stream volume. It took River B's energy and it rejuvenated itself. Therefore, River A would be the capital, C-A-P-T-O-R stream, and River B would be the captured stream. The neck point, um, very important. The neck point is where the river 
the profile or the channel of the river changes its slope. So we've are, we are familiar with the Nick Point waterfall. So it's a steep region along a river profile. What's interesting to note, and it's something that we don't see in a lot of uh, textbooks, is the term incised or entrenched meanders. So these are deep bends um, in the river with steep valley sides caused by vertical erosion. So what we see over here in this photo is you can see that the river has flown there, uh, has flown past the area. You can see that the meander is there, but it almost looks like something has cut and chiseled um, the, the, the land um, and, and the profile of the land as that meander bends and as that river winds through the, the land. Terraces, this is one that they also like to ask. So what happens is the remnants of the older floodplains will then form step-like features along the sides of the new floodplain. So now the old floodplain will then form a terrace and then the present floodplain um, would be there where the river is uh, flowing. A lot of the time you will have settlements on the older floodplain um, because 200 years ago the river um, was flowing there. However, if you have a lot of rainfall, then those settlements will be flooded um, because the older floodplain, the river used to be there. So you can see that it's level land, then it goes up with a terrace, level land, and then another step like. That's why we say it forms a step like feature. And in map work, you will see that you will have contour lines far apart, contour lines close together, contour lines far apart. So the contour lines close together next to the river will indicate your terrace um, and then your step like landform. Right, so we've referred to the graded river yesterday in the upper course, the middle course, and the lower course. So the graded river now has a smooth concave profile and your temporary base levels have been removed. So we don't have a lake, we don't have a waterfall. Right. The rate of the erosion is now equal to the rate of the deposition because we need a smooth flowing. Remember I said if you get good grades, then your school career is smooth flowing. So that's what we are looking at. Um, the graded river can now become rejuvenated, but what changes do we need? Let's have a look. Right, so very important, the changes, the sea level needs to drop. Number two, the land then therefore needs to rise due to faulting or isostatic uplift. We have to have an increase in the stream volume. This river needs to flow uh, faster uh, due to more rainfall. Or if through headward erosion over year, we can capture another river and then have a stronger flow and more energy. Let's have a look at the following. So what happens over here? So now we have a sea level that drops. The land has risen. We have an increase in stream volume. Have a look at the following. There's a change in my gradient. So therefore, the gradient now becomes steeper. The river has more energy. It starts to erode vertically. And now... I don't have my smooth profile anymore. My erosion exceeds my deposition. So on the previous slide, you had the, the gentleman with the crutch. And over here, you have a nice, lean, strong built, fast, younger individual. Therefore, the river is now rejuvenated. Right, what features will now form in the lower course? Um, and grade 12s, I sincerely apologize for the blue block that's over the writing. 
Um, I can't seem to to change it and get it out of the way, um, but uh, let's just work with, with what we have. All right, so let's have a look. In the lower course, after river rejuvenation, you can see that we used to have a level profile, and then now we have a nick point waterfall. So the nick point is where the graded stream previously entered the ocean. So increased vertical erosion begins over here. Right, so it's mostly a nick point waterfall. Then let's have a look at why we say that. So the previous sea level, remember we said the sea level has to drop. So the previous sea level, so therefore this area over here would have been over there. Right, a valley within a valley will form. So remember, the river would flow millions of years, millions of years will go uh, past, and then you will have your valley within a valley. So what happens over here is your vertical erosion um, deepens the river channel. So where we had a valley, remember that river flows faster, it's more energized, it's got a higher velocity, um, more erosive properties, and then you will get your valley within a valley. So then the old valleys will then form these step-like landforms that we refer to as terraces. Right. So then our incised or entrenched meanders, there's a lovely photo of it over here. So the vertical erosion of existing meanders lead to deep, steep-sided meanders. So the river formed this meander and through erosion, vertical erosion, you can see that we have those steep-sided valleys. So it won't be easy to hike up there. Right, this is where um geography gets interesting so again what is it what does it look like what happens there what are the impacts all the questions that geographers ask now come into play again we say look at the diagram so figure 2.2.5 g they tell us it's the oblique view of the area before river capture now you don't need to know oblique and plan view that's got nothing to do with the answering of the questions. You need to know that this diagram was before the river got captured, and this is after river capture. Then plan view, basically from the top, um, the capture river, which is river A, and then the captured river, which is river B over there. Right. Um, so what's interesting is if you look at this in your mind, grade 12s, that's basically what you should see. And then if you see this diagram, then you should also be able to have a, a visual of this in your mind. Right, so let's just do all the um, animations. So an energetic stream, River A, cuts back through headward erosion. It cuts through the watershed, and then intercepts, takes the water of river B. Then the watershed moves in the direction of the less energetic stream, and that's a term called abstraction. River A then becomes longer and river B shorter. So let's have a look at the following. So abstraction, you can see in this diagram that this area, this gray area over here, becomes bigger and this river has, is busy carving into the watershed ultimately will carve through the watershed capture river b and then what's going to happen to river b it won't have any energy right so therefore river b will then have the um the wind gap and Unless it's raining, River B won't have water because it's the source of River B has been taken away and River A has been rejuvenized. 
So what is river capture? When the river capture intercepts, it robs or it steals the headwaters of another river. So then when a more energetic river captures a less energetic river. Remember, grade 12s, river A can't do much unless it has the power, the velocity um, to erode backwards through or, or headward erosion into that watershed to capture river B. Let's have a look at why is this river capture happening. So river A has got a steeper gradient. Now you can see that on this side they've indicated the, the topography of the area and then at river B you don't see those lines. So now you can interpret this, this visual as this side has got a steeper gradient. Through headward erosion, they sometimes will give um, high rainfall, which you can also link to a larger stream volume. And then they will um, either say softer rock or harder rock um, either side of this watershed to indicate to you that River A flows through the less resistant rock. So it can erode through that watershed a lot quicker than uh, River B. Right. What fluvial features are associated? And this is very, very, very important. Um, all these terms are on your notes. And I'm sure that Mrs. Prinsler will allow me to share the PowerPoint with you. Um, I'll just get rid of some of the, the spelling errors on here and then see if I can get the, the diagrams and the blocks that's covering some of the letters and the headings um, and then just fix that. And then I will um, ask her if I can avail it to you. So very important, the cap to stream. Um, I sometimes refer to the captor stream as the captain. He's the main guy. He's the guy that says, especially in, in sailing, we will go this way. Um, and he's got the power. He's basically the dictator. So he can take the water from the other river. The captured stream, the river which has its water intercepted or taken by the captor river. So the captor stream, he's the robber. He goes and he takes the water from the other river. And then the captured stream, shame. He's the poor guy that's sitting next to the road with no cell phone and no money. Right, so he does not have any energy left. The misfit stream is the river that has lost its source. So in this diagram, river B now becomes the misfit stream. The album of capture literally looks like an elbow. It's got a almost 90 degree, close to 90 degree um, view. It looks like a, an elbow in um, if, if you have to bend your elbow. Um, the point of capture is where the change in the flow. Um, so basically what happens, so A erodes through the watershed and then captures river B, and then it changes the flow of river B. The wind gap, that's the area between the elbow of capture and the misfit stream where water stops flowing, and then the dry deposited gravels are exposed. Now, grade 12s, you can think for yourself that if this capture river takes water from this river, it's strong enough to erode through a mountain. Takes the water and has its own velocity, increased velocity. What's going to happen over here? This river has lost its source of water. So this river will dry up. Areas around, along this river won't have any agriculture uh, anymore. They won't have a source of the river. They will have an increase in finances, in getting water to this area over here. Okay, this is a lovely um, aerial view of what happened. So very important, you have your captured stream, 
and then you have your capture stream. So many moons ago, this area over here used to be the river. So if I can quickly just draw it. Let's use the yellow. So this used to be my river. Okay, there we go. However, my capture stream, my red river, has got more energy and it eroded backwards, headward erosion. And then my new river, I'm going to make it green. So my new river then forms this elbow of capture. Right. So basically, now you can see that even on this diagram, <clears throat> you can see that the blue lines over there are dotted or dashed, indicating, indicating that we don't have water in the, only in the rainy season. Over here, you can see that, oh my gosh, but there's a road going through there, which means that this uh, river had to be captured a long time ago. The year, there's a settlement, but what hap what's going to happen to the settlement? Because they won't have water anymore. Luckily, for this settlement, they do have a river flowing past the area. If you have a look at the elbow of capture, this would be your strong biceps. This would be your elbow where it bends. And then over here, you would have your hand with your fingers. Right. Very important. Impact can be positive or negative. So let's have a look at the following. The impact on the misfit stream. In other words, the river that was captured. So now there's a shortage of water. You can imagine that if I had a river flowing there and I had agriculture, I now don't have a water source, so farming or agriculture will suffer. Less fishing. Uh, recreation, people might not go uh, to the river and fish. We might not have water for canoeing or kayaking. If they had hydroelectricity, then those hydroelectric electricity um, areas, they won't have as, as much power, um, less water for industries, and then more deposition. Right. The impact on the cap to stream, the stream that robbed water. More water, more fertile soil, increase in farming. However, it can have more flooding. Remember impact? If we only ask for impact, you have to state the positives and the negatives. Increase in uh, or more erosion and then a positive impact on the economy. Very important to note, is if they ask um, a question such as the impact on the environment, then you can't say positive impact on the economy because the economy has got nothing to do with the natural areas. Right, this is an activity that we can quickly do together. It's a question that comes from November 2021. So they ask us to refer to the sketch map of rivers uh, Y and Z before river capture has taken place. So now you have to know your term river capture. So immediately you have to figure out, hang on, there's river Y, there's river Z. The key shows us that this long line of triangles indicates a watershed and my black lines over here indicate the rivers. So then they ask us to define the concept river capture. Again, you need to know that the river will then capture the, the headwaters of another river. 
when a more energetic river captures the headwaters of a less energetic river. Now, from this diagram, it will be difficult for some of you to see which river will capture um, which one. <laughs> so um, you have to know that it will be the more energetic river. So we can look at the drainage density. So I would I would say that river Y is the more energetic one because it's got more um, tributaries. Therefore, it will have a higher velocity. State one condition needed for river capture to take place. So we need a steeper gradient. We need more rainfall and we need less resistant or softer rock on the one side of the watershed. So this um, sketch was what the examiners drew, right? The source will say examiner's own sketch. So we don't know which side of the watershed will have the harder rock or the, the less resistant rock. But there are ways to identify it. Let's have a look at the next few questions. Now they ask to draw a sketch to illustrate the area after river capture has taken place. Now the questions will lead you to the next one. They say marks will be awarded for the accuracy of the sketch and indicating the following labels. You need the elbow of capture. You need to indicate the misfit stream, the wind gap. Oops, Daisy. Okay. So what would happen? Remember, we need a higher gradient. So this river flows close to the watershed. Therefore, you have a steeper gradient. You have your elbow of capture where this water has eroded backwards, captured river Z. So river Y is the capital stream and river Z would be the captured stream. So after river capture, let's have a look. They want the elbow of capture. So we need to label the elbow of capture. They want the misfit stream. So we need to say that river Z now is the misfit stream. They are looking at the accuracy of the sketch. So you can't draw river Y and Z flowing right. Okay, so you have to resemble the sketch that they give you in your question paper. Then they're also looking for the wind gap. So again, grade 12 is very important. Draw in pencil and label in pen. Um, a lot of the time we see drawings in pen and learners start scratching out um, and it looks terrible. So again, the neater you write and the neater you draw, the more um, we will be able to interpret your answers. Um, we sometimes, yo, it's difficult, but we have to read through everything. But it's just easier for you to get your marks if you write neat and you add all the labels to your drawings. Remember, answer and draw as though the person marking your paper does not know geography. Give us more than enough visual information and content in your answer so that we can we can give you the maximum amount of marks. All right, now they ask you, so now they've you had to draw your diagram and then the question asks, will river Y or Z experience rejuvenation after river capture? So river Y will be rejuvenated and then give a reason for your answer. And then they ask you to refer to your answer to the question above and explain the impact on the change or of the change on the capital stream. In other words, the robber stream. Okay, so let's have a look. River Y, the reason that it has now got the power of River Z. And then, oh, this is a lot, but don't worry, I will make sure that you get... Um, these answers. So increased vertical erosion, therefore it's got a higher um, erosive activity. The softer rock of the river Y will then erode faster into terraces. You will have new valleys forming. Um, you will have meanders that will become incised because now there will be a more vertical um, erosion. You can have a neck point that develops now because of the increase in the 
water's velocity. Then it will um, increase the water channel. And then lastly, the capture stream will be able to carry a greater load, um, therefore less deposition. So as, the, as River Y gets more energized, it will flow faster, it will have less material to deposit along the river course. And only later on in the lower course of River Y, um, when the river starts to slow down, it will start to deposit the load. Right. So this is a question based on river capture and very important the questions that geographers ask. So define the term river capture. What is it? Um, describe the erosion. So what is river capture and then what causes it? Identify the features L and M that results from the river capture. Again, just two times one. Again, what is it? Match the terms the capture stream and the misfit stream to streams J and K in diagram B. In other words, where is the capture stream and where is the misfit stream? Then what is a watershed? That can link to what or where is it? How can the process of river capture cause the watershed to change its position? So that's abstraction. In other words, what happened? At 1.5.5c, what effect will river capture have on the volume of water in stream K? What is the impact of river rejuvenation? Then how can it be managed? And you can see that question 1.5.6 now is a two times two question. So now they ask what can the local farming community around stream J do to continue with their daily activities after river capture has taken place? So how can they manage the fact that they now will have less um, water? Very important, if you study, I have repeated myself a million times through the course of yesterday and this morning, the questions that geographers for ask. What is it? Where is it? Why is it there? What happened? What does it look like? What is the impact? And how can it be managed? Grade 12s, I cannot stress those questions enough. If you look at your work, in your textbook, in your notes, in your workbooks, Look at the topic and ask yourself, can I be able, will I be able to answer what is it? What is river capture? Your definitions. Where is it? Why is it there? What is the reason for river capture? And then you can carry on and go through these questions. All right. Next one. Okay. Very, very, very important antecedent drainage patterns. Now in your survival kit, um, you also have uh, beautiful diagrams as to what happens at antecedent drainage patterns. So what happens before the uplift of the land and what happens after the uplift of the land? Let's have a look. So anti, um, if you have old things, you are looking into antiques, right? Um, and ancestors. Um, so anti means before or earlier. All right. So at number one, the river developed its course on an earlier landscape. So the river was there before the landscape was uplifted or by folding and folding. All right, so very important. Let's have a look. So this river was there. All right, now what happens? At two, tectonic forces compress the underlying rock. There you can see the arrows. And then folding and faulting or then warping leads to the uplift of the land. So the rate of down cutting or downward erosion by the river is greater than the rate of the uplift. So this river will still flow and then the land will be up 
lifted. Right, so this compression will then form ridges. You can see that bend in, in the landform over there. And then this river cuts a gorge through the ridge um, as it maintains its course. So the land will be lifted, but this river is just carrying on. The river then is older than the landscape or the structures that it flows over. Right, so very important, anti, it means the river was there, and then while the river was flowing there, your uplift, your folding, and your faulting occurred. Right, now you have your superimposed drainage pattern. Um, what's interesting with superimposed is, um, I think the learners will know exactly what I refer to now in, on Instagram and TikTok. And I can't mention Facebook because my learners say, ma'am, Facebook is for old people. So, and also a while ago, the learners were quite into Snapchat. And those filters are placed on your view um, and on your face. So it's superimposed onto your photo. So if you add a filter and you add all the lashes and the uh, rosy cheeks and not sure if the gentleman can add muscles yet um, and add a six pack, but it's all placed on top of the original um, photo or the original video that you placed on TikTok. So let's have a look. Tectonic uplift forms ridges on the landscape and the river is not there yet. At number two, the erosion materials are deposited. They now cover the ridges and the river develops on the new landscape. The river then imposes itself. So you can see that there's the uplift and then the lighter brown over here is our eroded material. So there's the ridge in diagram two. So over here where my laser pointer is, and then that's what I refer to. Okay, so there's the ridging, and there it is in diagram two. Now you can see that the river is flowing there. And then now this river will start eroding the softer overlaying layers. The hard ridges will then be exposed. It cuts through the ridging and it maintains its course. So this river then is younger than the landscape that it flows over. Remember the tectonic uplift, this um, brown section of the diagram, the darker brown section, it was there in diagram one. Then in diagram two, we had softer lock, rock, apologies, um, and then this river could erode through them, right? So this river is superimposed and it's younger. Even though it looks like exactly the same that the river's carved through it, just remember that this was there. Then the eroded material came, and then this river from diagram two started to erode through the softer rock and then ultimately eroded through the harder rock. So this river was not there when the tectonic uplift formed those ridges. And it, in diagram three, it superimposed itself on the landscape. All right. Now, grade 12s, we get to something that I like because it's it's applicable to everyday life. And this is our drainage basins and our catchment areas. A few years ago, Cape Town and the Western Cape experienced drought. Um, and currently now we have rain and it, it's wind and, and we had flooding and uh, lots of accidents on the roads. But yes, we have water and our dams are filling up, but we have 
nothing if we don't look after our drainage basins and our catchment areas. If I can give something personal, uh, my mother is based in Oatsorn and recently they had a lot of rainfall. Um, a lot of the infrastructure is literally down the river course. Bridges are damaged and we now have to boil our water there. Um, the water basically looks, we joke and we say that if you open the tap, it looks like you're pouring a beer. It is terribly brown. Um, so we are very hesitant to drink the water. But the reason for it is a few years ago, they had fires in the, in the catchment areas. And the soil and the vegetation is yet to recover. So now with the recent rains, all the sand and debris and everything got deposited into the dams. So you can't um, purify water uh, for human consumption with too many chemicals. And even if you if you do the dishes, then when you're finished, you can see the sediments and the sand in the in the uh, basin. However, if someone now goes and they pour chlorine that we normally use for for pools or to clean ponds and they go to the dams and the catchment areas and they now start pouring chlorine in the rivers that leads into the dams supplying Cape Town or for this example Oatsorn. The water won't be um, suitable for human consumption. So it's very important that we manage our drainage basins and our catchment areas. We can't just build um, in our um, catchment areas. We need to be very uh, specific and, and look at what are we doing to the natural environment. And that's our role as geographers is, yes, we have to provide for the humans and, and for individuals. However, we need to have a balance between nature um, as well as humans. And uh, recently, humans have become quite greedy. So let's have a look at different strategies. Now, grade 12 is very important to note is that um, strategies are most likely to be asked with a diagram or an extract where you have to read as to what has happened. So it will it will be almost like a case study. Um, it resembles a comprehension test in languages. We have to read the extract and then form your answers. Right. So strategies for uh, managing the drainage basins, monitor the water quality frequently. So in the example of Oatsorn, in the local newspapers and on their social media, they said, we apologize for the beer looking water in your taps. However, please boil it. Um, to get rid of, of some of the impurities. What majority of the people do, if they can afford it, they would go and buy water um, and, and just use the, the municipal water for washing dishes or even washing um, in, in itself. However, um, your white bedding won't be white after you've washed it. It took about two weeks for the water to, to get better. Um, and it's almost it's almost clear now. Then what can municipalities do? Treat or purify the sewage and industrial wastewater for reuse. Again, grade 12s, that is if the municipality has the, the funds to do that. Manage the usage of water from drainage basins. So what happened when we had the drought in the Western Cape a few years, 2017 roughly? Um, Cape Town um, implemented the different water restrictions and the different levels. Educate people on the importance of the drainage basins. You can't just go and pour um, municipal rubble into, into the catchment areas. Um, put legislation in place to find the polluters. You can't now go if you're a mechanic and empty all your dirty oil into the river because you don't want to pay someone to come and remove it from your premises. So there has to be legislation. Um, there has to be uh, the necessary infrastructure in order to manage our drainage basins and our catchment areas. 
we have to protect our wetland areas as they act as a sponge, slowly releasing water um, and then reducing flooding. Now, a lot of you are familiar with where Canal Walk is, and I might be giving away my age now, but when I was a little kitty wink, Canal Walk, the area where Canal Walk is and Ratanga Junction, the theme park that closed down, that entire area of Canal Walk, um, it used to be a wetland. Um, it, and, it, and it breaks my heart every time that I drive past there. Yes, it's nice to go and shop if you're able to. And it's nice to do window shopping because let's be honest, teachers could only afford window shopping. But then I always think back as to, wow, this used to be a wetland. Um, and what they've done is the developers, that's also why you have Ratanga Park and, and you have the, the, the channels and, and the water flowing through the canal walk area, even though you have those high rising apartment blocks and office blocks. They had to protect that wetland area, um, especially with all our rain in the Cape winters. You have to, if you're in the rural areas, monitor overgrazing to reduce erosion. And then this is where map work comes in, our beautiful buffer zone in GIS to avoid development. Um, and here they refer to informal settlements that are developed too close to rivers. Now, you can have a look at where would you like to settle? You need level land. So let's have a look back at settlements. You need level land. You need uh, protection. You need fuel. You need um, food. And then you need water. So a lot of those sites and situational factors come into play where informal settlements are developed close to a water source um, in this diagram, close to the road because they need access to transport to get to their place of work. But then they are building in the floodplain. Um, and then if we have increase in rainfall, all those low lying areas are flooded. Then removing alien vegetation. So alien vegetation, just like aliens, ET, that comes with this bicycle from space. So alien vegetation is vegetation that is not supposed to be in the area. Um, it is, it's, it's vegetation that needs a lot of water to grow. So we remove the vegetation as they absorb water and we're trying to reduce the impact of um, the, the alien vegetation on our uh, drainage basins and catchment areas. Then we would like to encourage the growth of vegetation as it improves the infiltration that reduces flooding. Right, drainage basins. Let's have a look. So oops, I'm just going to go through everything. There we go. So what is a drainage basin? It's uh, sources of water for domestic, agricultural, and industrial use. The drainage basins will control the flow of water to reduce flooding. It will provide food sources to people, for example, fish. Apologies. Drainage basins are used to construct permanent sources of water dams. So we in Cape Town, we have the Tiervatus Kloof Dam, we have the Steenbras um, Dam, Upper and Lower, we have the Vemers Hook Dam, we have the Berg River Dam, and the Berg River Dam, if I'm not mistaken, is the youngest one. It's the newest member of the dams of the Western Cape, and um, that's in Franschhoek. So um, drainage basins and the catchment areas are used um, to store uh, uh, water for us. Uh, hydroelectricity at the Stienbras Dam, we have a hydroelectric plant. Um, so it also we need to look after our drainage basin so that we have enough flow um, and enough water in our dams in order to generate hydroelectricity. We need to look after our drainage basins to sustain the plant and animal life and our ecosystems because we are all connected. We need to control the water pollution 
Um, the floodplains of the large rivers with fertile soil for agricultural use. So what happens in the floodplain is there where the river used to flow, it deposited fertile soil. So on map work specifically, you will see that you will have your perennial river and then you will have level land next to that river. And the, the level land next to that river will nine out of 10 times uh, be covered either by orchards and vineyards or cultivated land. Then the drainage basins are also used for water sports and holiday resorts. So great twelves, you can imagine that if you have a drainage basin and you have a river flowing past it or, or through it, um, and you have a holiday resort, and all of a sudden now that river is polluted. People can't do recreational activities. The holiday resort itself will have a loss of income. The people that work in that holiday resort um, won't be able to go to work uh, because they won't have uh, people coming there. Therefore, the holiday resort won't be able to pay them. Then the workers at the holiday resort will then have um, economical challenges. So it's a whole, I always say, like Lion King circle of life where everyone is connected and we need to keep our balance between us as individuals, humans, and the natural um, environment. Right. I've been um, hammering on how to study and how to read and interpret the sources. And the next uh, few sections will link up with what I've said. So firstly, oops, it is. Right, so this is a very important slide. You have to read the instruction and identify the topic. Now, grade 12, recently, the question is not just question two. It's question two, and it says geomorphology. Question 2.1, um, short questions, 2.2, short questions, and then 2.3, for example, they will say question 2.3, river capture. So you know that the questions will link with the topic of river capture. Study the source, read the title, the labels, the key as well as the text. Identify all the elements or features that you can recognize and then add labels and notes and additional visuals. And only then you start answering your questions. Let's have a look at this um, slide. Now, when I went through the PowerPoint, this slide is a lot. Um, so I try to make the writing a little bit smaller because it was overlapping. So I'm hoping that I succeeded in that attempt. So again, we've read the instruction. They tell us to study figure 1.5 based on river capture. So we can't scan the questions yet because it's not given. Study the source, read the title, the labels, the key and the text. So over there, there's my topic, river capture. It's an energetic river that intercepts water of another river. So grade 12s, if you see a question like this, that question paper is yours. You can scratch on it as much as you like. So write there that it's a more energetic river intercepting the water of another river. Then with a key, they give us the directional flow of the streams. They give us the stream channels and they give us headward erosion. And where can we see headward erosion? There with the stream Okay, so immediately cutting back. So now you can think, okay, stream K is the one that's going to capture stream J. The scale, you can see the watershed. And then very important, it's K is energetic. It cuts back through headward erosion. It will become longer going towards stream J. Why does K cut back? It flows over softer rock. It might have a steeper gradient, a larger volume, and then it might flow at a lower level. So then we move to diagram B. K will then intercept J, which is this river over here, and K intercepted J at L. So L would be the elbow of capture or the point of capture. 
thin stream K is the capital stream, meaning it will have more water. Then um, stream L over here. So J used to be there. That used to be J. But now this is the captured stream. Then stream J will become the misfit stream. Less water. Why? Because stream K robbed it from its water. And then M over there is our wind gap, a dry river valley with river gravels. So what have we done? We have added our labels and notes. We've identified all the elements and we studied the source. So now we can go over to the questions. Okay. So these are the questions that they've asked. So define the term river capture for two marks. What is river capture? At question 1.5.2, describe the erosion associated with the process. In other words, what is it? What does it look like? Identify features L and M that resulted from river capture. So there we've said L is the elbow of capture and M is the misfit stream. Match the uh, terms capture stream and misfit stream to streams J and K in diagram B. So where is it? Then they ask us, what is a watershed? How can the process of river capture cause the watershed to change its position? Abstraction, right? So it goes back, it erodes back into the watershed. So let's have a look at how they would have liked us to answer the questions. Right, define the term river capture. When one river captures or intercepts, robs or steal the headwaters of another, River. I just want to point out that in the brackets over here, it says one, that is wrong, it has to be two, right? All your terms are two marks, your terms and your concepts. 1.5.2, they ask us to describe the erosion associated with the process of river capture, that is headward erosion, and it erodes upstream. 1.4.3, so L is the elbow of capture and M is the wind gap. At 1.5.4, J would be the misfit stream and K the capture stream. Let's have a look at question 1.5.5. What is a watershed? It's a high-lying area that separates two different drainage basins. At B, how can the process of river capture cause the watershed to change? So the watershed will be lowered and then your headward movement will retreat back horizontally. Question C, what effect will river capture have? It will increase the volume of the water in the stream that it captured. What can the local farming community around Stream J do to continue with their daily activities after river capture has taken place? In other words, they would have to access other water sources, Jojo tanks or um, have tanks um, being driven into the area. They can harvest their rainwater. Um, they can make use of wind pumps and boreholes to access groundwater, um, building small um, farm dams. Now, the thing is, again, it is an economic impact. Um, then they can recycle or purify water. And then also they can cut down the amount of livestock on their farms. So ultimately, a lack of water will lead to a lack of farming in that community and ultimately lead to a lower quality of life for those individuals living along the a captured stream, which will now be the misfit stream. Right, um, grade 12s, what I would like you to do now is we can quickly have a look at the questions that um, I've given you or you have in front of you, and we can go through them um, quickly and have a look at where you can um, 
change your answers. If you have any answers or any topics that you would like me to go over, um, again, if there are any concerns, areas where I might have gone too fast, um, please either in the chat or on the WhatsApp group, please communicate with me. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly put the, the questions, I'm going to share the questions quickly. Right, so we've done questions one, two, five. If not, then um, please do so now. All right, so let's see if we can have some interaction up until 10 o'clock. Um, how would you define the drainage basin? Now, if you were quick earlier, you would have given or you would have been able to get the definition for the drainage basin. Let's see if you can quickly type your answers. Um, just you can give me the question that you would have li you would like to to give the answer for, and on the WhatsApp chat or in the the chat group, um, you can just so type one point two confluence. It is, and then you give me the answer. All right, let's see if we can get some interaction from the learners. Okay, is it Rusha? Drainage basin forms the catchment area of drainage basin. Huh? Okay, let's see if we can get another answer. So, Rusha, I just want to point out the following. I think you repeated drainage basin over there. So, the drainage basin is an area drained by a river and its tributaries. Then it looks like Matthew, area of land where water from rain drains down into a water body. Drainage basin refers to the total area of land surface drained by a river. Yes, watershed. Okay, so now we had watershed, that's 1.5. Um, I think that's Kali that said, if I remembered correctly. Watershed is a high-lying area separating two drainage basins. Very important, well done. Um, then Kavanandi, I think it is. Uh, confluence would be 1.2, the point where two rivers meet, yes. And then I don't know who gave the beautiful answer for interfluve is a high-lying area which separates two rivers. And then base flow, 1.4, it looks like the learner is Esona. 
the base flow, the movement of groundwater that seeps into the streams. Well done. All right. Um, I'm getting a lot of um, messages. I can see them asking if I can add learners. Unfortunately, I can't add um, on my phone because I need to access the, the link um, on my website or on, on my um, WhatsApp on the web. So unfortunately, I can't add anyone. But if you are two learners together, use one phone and then just tell me um, who is interacting with me. Uh, watershed is an area of high ground separating two drainage basins. Lovely. Um, looks like Lisa Kanya. Um, then watershed high lying areas separating different basins. Well done. Right. Um, grade 12's question two is really um, relatively easy. We have the permanent river and the periodic river. And then what I would like you to do now is explain both rivers in relation to the water table. So I just want you to, just a few learners, just to explain the rivers in relation to the water table. So the answer is right in front of you. I just need you to have a look. Um, just a few learners. I'm loving the interaction. And then if you can just give me um, the answers for question 2.2 A and B. Okay, I'm seeing people are also um, acting and reacting on the chat group. Um, Tanak, Awonke, and Tanak again, thank you very much. Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to, to see the, the chat also um, as, I'm, as I'm only sharing my one screen. <clears throat> Let's have a look. Question 2.2a and 2.2b. So we know that A is permanent and B is periodic. So let's have a look at question 2.2. What happens to the water table and in those rivers? A permanent river flows all year round. It looks like Claude flows all year round because the river table is always above the river, uh, I assume river bed, throughout the year. Uh, it looks like Sky, the water table always intersects in the wet and dry season, which result in a permanent river. Beautiful. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the answers. Right, so let's have a look. Right. Um, periodic rivers only flow during the rainy season. Why does it look like some of you already have the answers there? Because the spelling errors on the WhatsApp link up with the spelling errors on the document. Are you taking shortcuts here, learners? Are you taking shortcuts? A permanent river flows all year because the water table is always above the riverbed throughout the year. Well done. Okay. Right, so periodic rivers will only flow during the rainy season. And then let's have a look at question three point. No, let's move on to the work that we did today on the fluvial landforms. So um, I'm hoping that you can see the diagrams on the screens. So remember, what are they giving you? They're giving us question eight fluvial landforms. They're giving us fluvial landforms in the upper course. A is a waterfall and B is rapids. So then they ask us state one way in which feature A can be eliminated. In other words, what can happen or what needs to happen to this river in order to get rid of the waterfall? Does anyone know the answer?
Now the group is dead. Anyone know the answer? One way in which feature A can be eliminated, in other words, so that the waterfall won't be there. Um, Shiloh Martin, Claude Kylie, and Lisa Kanya says backward erosion, backward retreat, headward erosion must dominate. And all of them are correct. All right, so backward retreat. In other words, headward erosion must be the strongest one. All right, 8.1.3. What are the benefits of the fluvial landform at A? So what are the benefits of having a waterfall in the area where you stay? Ooh, that's a lovely, lovely word. It looks like Kylie, aesthetic beauty. And so it's, it's nice to look at. And then it's a tourist attraction. Shiloh, again, tourist attractions. Um, Claude says they attract tourists to the area. And then also um, tourist attraction looks like Abonga. Um, they attract tourists to the area and they can be, water can be used to generate electricity. Nice, hydroelectricity uh, creates turbulence, loved by rafters for water activities and hydroelectricity. Well done. Um, so you guys have actually given a lot of answers that are not on um, this uh, little memo that Mrs. Prinsley has provided us with. So water can be used to gener generate electricity. And then also with um, a lot of you that said it uh, creates turbulent uh, love by rafters. So that answer I will link to tourists coming into the area to do some river rafting. Right, so now we move on to fluvial landforms in the middle and the lower course. So we're not just stuck in the middle, they can give us the um, lower course also. So the stream channel pattern above that you can see it's the bend in the river, so that is the meander. Right, in which course of the river is this channel pattern found? And again they've given us the answer because they said it's the middle and the lower course. So question 8.2.2's answer is the middle and the lower course. Right, now what I would like you to do for question 8.2. Oopsie, it should be 3. Um, draw a fully labeled cross section between A and B. So if you if the learners can quickly draw a fully labeled cross section. Okay? Um, remember what I taught you yesterday, draw your cross section as though I am not a geography teacher, I am super stupid and you only have that visual, that sketch to tell me what's happening between A and B.
Okay, let's have a look. I'm hoping um, slip off slope under cut slope shop. Um, there's someone that drew it. Oh, nice. Uh, slip off slope under cut slope. Slip off slope under cut slope. Um, okay. Right, let's have a look. Ah, uh, ha, 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 ha. I would like to know how do you know that this slope is concave or con convex and this slope is concave? I, uh, I see some corruption here, teachers. Are these learners clever or have they been issued with the answers already? Let's have a look. Um, this one's upside down. So, slowest current. Okay, so I don't know who this student is. Um, this one over here. This is a very good um, sketch. Thank you very much. It's got all the labels. Let me just turn my phone around. The slowest current. Um, the cut, the bank, okay, the flow, fastest current, therefore erosion dominates. Right, very well done. You have everything except if I would make it 110% correct, I would actually just give this sketch a heading to say cross section between A and B, then this would be Magnifico. I really, I really appreciate this drawing. So the other learners, you are giving the correct drawing there, slip off and undercut. Um, but I would like to have a little bit more information as to why it's the slip off and the undercut slope. So why is the shape um, like that? Right. So if we can have a look at um, at A. Okay, so also what you are leaving out, grade 12s, is you need to, um, in on your sketch, you need to put the cross-section labels there. So you have been asked to draw a labeled cross-section between A and B. So I need you to indicate which side of your sketch is A and which one is B. So along the inside of the meander, you will see if people do canoeing, they will always take the inside bend because that is where the water flows faster. Um, sorry, the outer side, so they will go where the river flows faster. Then on the inside, you will see your deposition, your slip off slope, so that's where you will find your um, slower flow. And then if you are not as adventurous, then you will take the inside. Okay, so state one characteristic of the slip off slope, deposition takes place, it's also very shallow and it's a convex slope. A characteristic of the undercut slope is there's a lot more erosion and that slope will have a concave profile. Um, there was another sketch where they had a gentleman standing on the slip off slope in the water and his friend was standing on the opposite bank and the gentleman on on a side said come in it's not that deep and then um the gentleman on b he had his foot in the air and then they had two fish at the bottom saying idiot um, because this guy is very, very stupid as he does not know what's going to happen. So immediately, as, as he would step into the river, it won't be as shallow and he would be caught in the, in the current um, and, and in that faster flowing current over there. So that's why the fish called the gentleman an idiot. So those are all um, examples of how we can ask questions. So we can ask why is, so we won't ask the word idiot, but we can ask why would it not be wise for the gentleman at B to jump in the river um, on riverbank B? Because it's faster flowing, he can drown easily, um, there's a faster flow and so on and so forth. All right, 
Let's have a look at question 8.3. So now they are only focusing on fluvial landforms in the lower course. So let's have a look there. We have about eight minutes left. Identify the fluvial landform B in the diagram above. So B is the Oxbow Lake. Right. Please don't just write Oxbow. It's an Oxbow Lake. In which course of the river is the fluvial land above? Oh my goodness, the heading says the lower course. So again, geography's answers are always in front of you. Now they ask you to briefly describe the formation of feature B. And I want to point out a few things over here. We are looking for the meander that is cut off from the mainstream. Why can I not highlight this? Okay. Erosion takes place leading to the formation of the meander neck. Okay. And then as time goes on, very important, it's the neck that reduces in size. And then ultimately this neck is cut off from the mainstream. Water will then flow straight no longer uh, following the meander, and then where deposition takes place, it is separating the meander loop from the main stream. Okay, and then you can... Right, so those are the important terms that we can, we can look at when we um, answer a question. Remember, it is, I think it was to not sure about the the um, mark allocation most likely two times two all right so then provide a suitable term to describe a when it dries up so when a dries up that would be a meander scar um, so you can see that the next oxbow lake would be a as this neck will get uh, narrower and narrower Ultimately, the section labeled A will be cut off from the mainstream. Then when it dries up, that would be a meander scar. Then identify the fluvial feature at C. That is our delta. And then what term is given to the river channels, the, the branches, distributaries, and then explain two conditions necessary for the formation of deltas. So very important, what do we have over here? You can see that we have the sand over there, so meaning lots of deposition. And if we have a look at the answers, the river must have a large amount of sediment. The sea must have weak currents and a small tidal range, so the waves aren't as rough. And then also the sea must be very shallow at the river mouth. So there the mark allocations were added, so it's two full sentences worthy of two marks. Right, then I think this is our last question. Define river rejuvenation. So we've done that today. It's the process where the river regains and renews its erosive power and begins to erode vertically. Right, mention the two causes of river rejuvenation. So what will lead to that river having more um, or higher velocity, having more energy? High rainfall, increasing, increasing the erosive potential of the river, the sea level that dropped, and then also due to river capture. And again, two causes, so you have to mention two things. Right. Give two evidences or features of rejuvenation. Let's see if we can interact on the WhatsApp group. I would like two um, evidence, evidences or then two features that we have of um, rejuvenation. So question 9.3, what can we find in a river that um, has been rejuvenated?
9.3 a waterfall. Correct. A nick point waterfall. Um, 9.3 meanders. Is it easy? Okay, right, so let's have a look there. Um, incised meanders, um, it looks like Shiloh. So um, Shiloh, yes, there will be meanders, but it would be wiser for you to add the term incised meanders because remember we've spoken about the um the increase in vertical erosion also. So very important, add the word incised meander. Um, Zizo, a nick point, then valley within a valley. Yes, very important, your terraces or then the valley within a valley. Well done. Right, river capture. So now let's have a look at how this um, question is exactly the same as the one on the notes, but it's just in a different way. So we know that river capture is when one river is stealing water from another river. Now they ask us to identify the features marked A, B, and C. So before capture, so these little scribbles would be our watershed. So then you have the captive stream. Okay, so in other words, this river was captured. So the robber is holding this river captive. So river one eroded through the watershed and captured river two. So let's have a look. A would be the elbow of capture. B, the wind gap. C, the misfit stream, and D, I would say, is the watershed. Let's see. Yes. Right. Then let's have a look at the changes that will happen in River 1. I will put the answers there as that's a repeat of what we've done um, today. Again, not just meanders, learners, very important, incised meanders. Right. Remember? They've been cut, that vertical erosion. Right, so there we go. I'm sure you have the answers close by. Then let's have a look at the measures that can be taken to protect our catchment areas. So there we go. And that is the last one. Um, grade 12. So I'm not going to go through question 11 now because on the slide I've gone into quite a lot of, of detail. Um, we have reached the end of this um, session.